Shalom. First and foremost, I want to give all praise, honor, and glory unto Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha, Kutash, double honors to the apostle elders of Great Millstone, peace and blessings to the hopeful elect. The name of the Heavenly Father, the true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. Yah is He, and Hawa means to be or to exist. Right? The Heavenly Father has a Hebrew name, not a modern name that people like to call on God or Jehovah. No, those are the incorrect names of the Heavenly Father. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. And the true name of the Heavenly Father's Son is Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. Yah is He, and Yahweh Shai is Savior or Deliverer. And those are the names to call upon, those are the names to believe in, and those are the names that will give you salvation. As it's written, there's uh, no other name given among uh, no other name uh, given among men whereby, whereby we must be saved. There's only one name, and that is Yahweh Bahasham Yahweh Shai. Now, going back, I would like to continue uh, breaking down the book of Colossians. Uh, heading into the third chapter now but just to give a little synopsis a little brief you know brief uh review over the first and second chapters if you have not watched the uh first uh for chapters one and two pretty much in chapter one of uh colossians pretty much paul gives his salutations as he normally does in his uh uh his uh, letters and then he shifts gears getting into i, be I believe about the 13th verse about getting into pretty much the importance of Yahweh Shai, Yahweh Shai's rank. And like I've stated in those past videos, there's a reason for that. Because the believers there in Colossus were dealing with an angel called and certain uh, Gnostic and certain, uh, I believe the word is syncretism, certain beliefs were an, which were an amalgamation of other beliefs that pretty much go all the way back to the Essenes during the time of the Grecian Empire dealing with the Maccabees. Right, which were super hardcore into being very spiritual, wanted to keep the ways of the Heavenly Father. But over over time, eventually that belief, you know, fell away from uh from the Heavenly Father and got amalgamated with other stuff, uh, intertwined with it as well. And that's what the uh believers in Colossus had to believe. Uh I'm sorry, not believe, but I had to deal with. And that's why Paul was very stressed for them because he saw uh, he heard about their faith from uh, one of his uh, servants, I'm going to guess, which was Epiphras, but also being uh, pained, uh, being very, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But uh, very concerned would be the word, very concerned for them because he understood what they had to deal with over there when men were trying to be over spiritual or too spiritual. And the things that these men, certain men over there in Colossus were trying to put on these believers could take them away from Yahweh Shai and Paul was very concerned for them. And then that's where we get into the second chapter of Colossians where Paul pretty much gets into being built up in Yahweh Shai, having received the wisdom, the proper wisdom, knowledge, understanding of the Heavenly Father and Son to be built up in Yahweh Shai, be built up in the wisdom, knowledge, understanding of Yahweh Shai and to conform your life to him. All right, so that's for the first two chapters. Now we're in the third chapter. So this is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. And as you can see, the little subtitle says, put on uh, the new self. So it says, if ye then be risen with Hamashiach, seek those things which are above, where Hamashiach sitteth on the right hand of the Heavenly Father. Now, to, in order to understand the risen part, we have to go back to Colossians, the second chapter, right? Because there was a part here, Right? Now it says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, excuse me, it says buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of the Heavenly Father. And like I stated in the second, uh, in the, the video for the second chapter, what is being buried? Buried usually associates with death, right? So what was put to death? The old you, the old man, right? And now having received this understanding Right. Put yourself. This is something that I like to do when reading these scriptures. Put yourself as an example, because we all are examples of this, having come, having been allowed to come into this faith by Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. Right. Use yourself as an example. Right. Remember how you used to be before you uh, had this wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, before you knew Yahweh Shai. That's that old man. Right. 
And once you receive the wisdom, knowledge, understanding, once you receive the truth, that old man was put to death, that old you, right? The one that your friends like, the ones that was like, oh, we remember when you used to do this with us, when you used to go here with us, you used to come over here with us and do all this stuff. You don't do that stuff. That was that old man that you put to death. He's buried, right? With him in baptism. And the baptism was what? Hearing this word. Wherein you are also risen with him. Now, what is risen? That new man, the new you, right? In the image of the heavenly father's son. So that is what is risen, right? That was that was what was put to death, buried, the old man, and what has risen is the new man in Yahweh Shai. So going back to uh, Colossians third chapter verse one, if ye then be risen with Hamashiach, which is the new man, right? Which is really that really is the the actual you, who you really are, right? That old man was just really you know things that you collected from being in the world that was never truly who you were that's why you always were always felt like an outcast that you always felt like or maybe was treated like an outcast or felt like an outcast because you trying to you know blend in with the world you never really meshed with them you never really you know clicked with it right that was you just trying to pretend to fit in with the world right but but having come into this understanding this is the true you this is the real you so if ye then be risen with Hamashiach, seek those things which are above, right? So now that you are risen with Yahweh you have this understanding, right? Seek those things which are above. And what was Yahweh all about? Yahweh was all about doing his father's business, right? He said, I am, uh, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So now what? You're seeking the things, right? Which are above, which are heavenly things, the kingdom of the heavenly father, right? Remember, the buried, the, the old man that is buried, those things died with him. The aspirations that you had in this world, the things that you wanted in this world, whatever you uh, want to seek after, those things are dead and buried. Now that you have been risen, this new man has been risen with Yahweh Shai, you are now attaining or you want to seek after heavenly things. And those heavenly things is what? The kingdom of heaven. Righteousness to be established on earth, right? For you to be a better man, be a better woman in Hamashiach. Those are the things that we are seeking on high. Where Hamashiach sitteth on the right hand of the Heavenly Father. Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Again, going back to why. Because the old man was the one that uh, set his mind on the things on the earth. But remember that old man is buried now. You have been risen with your house shot, so your mind is in heavenly places. So now what you're going to set your affection on things above. And when you go into this word affection, <laughs> right, two definitions, the C definition and the third one, it says to be of the same mind, example, agree together, cherish the same views, be har harmonious. And whose views are we sharing uh, 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 the same as the Heavenly Father through His Son, Yahweh Shai, right? Be harmonious, being an of, the, of one mind. Then Yahweh Shai say, I would like, uh, as we, uh, roughly paraphrasing, uh, I want them, when he prayed for his elect, I want them to be of one mind, just like we are of one mind, right? So that's pretty much being in harmonious, being of one mind, one agreement with the Heavenly Father and His Son. And the other definition says to direct one's mind to a thing, to seek, to strive for, right? To seek or strive for what? The kingdom of heaven. To seek or strive after righteousness, right? A righteous kingdom, right? Because uh, when you look at this kingdom, this kingdom is not profitable. This kingdom, like it says, arise ye and depart, Micah 2 and 10, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. It will destroy you with a sore destruction. You, we are not getting, we cannot get any rest here. We have to set our, our, our minds, our affection on things above, right? Which is a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom where we can get rest, where a kingdom where we can be at peace, where there's going to be peace on earth, actual peace on earth, not this fake peace on earth that, you know, the powers that be of today try to pretend or, you know, people try to say, oh, there's going to be peace on earth if we live this certain way. No, there's going to be true peace on earth when the law, statutes, and the commandments of the Heavenly Father are instituted in the earth and enforced. Right? <clears throat> so that's the things that we're setting our mind above. Which, uh, let me get a precept. Uh, 
believe it's 10 and 4. Excuse me. This is Sirach chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, The power of the earth is in the hand of the Lord, and in due time he will set over it one that is profitable. So in very in due time, Lord's willing very soon, the Heavenly Father is going to set a earth that is profitable, and that begins with Yahweh Shai. Second Ezra chapter 6 and verse 9, for Esau is the end of the world, right? The end of this age, because this age is not profitable, right? But the age to come, right, which Jacob is the beginning of, beginning of it that followed, which starts with Yahweh Shai, that is the profitable earth. That's the, uh, the, the earth that's going to be profitable for us, right? And it's even going to be profitable for the other nations as well. Now, again, they won't be on the same level as an Israelite. But still, the earth is even going to be profitable for them because right now under this current captivity, under this current administration, if you will, this earth is not profitable. Inflation, uh, children being taken and things like that. You know, we uh, let's not be, you know, timid to talk about these things because these are things that happen. Although YouTube will censor your videos and I understand that, but these are the things that are happening in the earth. These are the true things that are happening. Children are being, you know, taken and things like that. I won't say the complete word, but children are going missing and things like that. How could this be a profitable earth? How could you, your mind be at ease or at rest here, knowing when these things could happen to your children? All type of wickedness that your children are exposed to that you don't want, but they push out there. Your, your mind can never be at ease. <clears throat> and then, what the hell? Get out of here. The second time it's happened. Right? Your mind can never truly be at ease in this place. <laughs> right? So that's why we set our affection on things above, not on earth. Because the fashion of this world passeth away. But the kingdom, the fashion of the kingdom of heaven, will never pass away. So continuing, verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Hamashiach in the Most High. Remember that that old man died, right? So the aspirations and everything with him died as well. Right in our real life, which begins in the kingdom of heaven, is hit with Yahweh Shai. Verse 4 When Hamashiach, which is Yahweh Shai, who is our life, shall appear when he returns back, like he says in Matthew 24 and 30, then shall the Son of Man appear with the clouds of heaven and shall appear with great glory. Right? That's when he comes back with the so called UFOs that people call them, but we know them as the chariots of Israel or the chariots of God, written of in the scriptures. When Hamashiach, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, right? Which are the elect. Lord's willing, we are. Uh, we endure unto the end. Lord's willing, we are those men. We shall also appear with him. How? Because the elect are going to be delivered from the destruction to come. Right? And they will also be with Yahweh Shai. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What does it mean to mortify? Mortify means what? To put to death. Right, mort having to deal with uh, death. So mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, right? Meaning that what? Put to death those old ways with the old man because that is not something that once you come into this understanding, once you come into this faith, that the old you just completely dies. No, there are things that have to die over time and there are things that are about you that must go away. <laughs> things that we have picked up in the earth that, you know, uh, the Heavenly Father will not accept. So you have to mortify these things, put them to death, right? And what do we pick up in the earth? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate, uh, in, I'm sorry, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. And I'll bring that, I'll read this precept in a different translation. But first, fornication, you know, adultery, dealing with another man's wife. These are things that we picked up in the world, right? Also spiritual adultery, right? Dealing with these other gods. Some of us grew up in a Christian church. Some of us was Catholic, dealing with Jesus Christ. Maybe some <laughs> believed in Allah, whatever it may have been. Those are the type of fornications, right? <clears throat> dealing with uh, uh, these other gods or dealing with uh, other men's wives. These are things that we picked up in the world, thinking that they were fine because why we are... That's what pretty much society makes it seem to be, that these things are okay. Nothing bad will happen to you. Heavenly Father doesn't care, but he does care. Right? Uncleanness. Uh, one thing I think of is the dietary law, right? Eating shrimp, pork, crab, and lobster. That's not to be so. Right? The Heavenly Father said, uh, uh, well, excuse me, Paul said, 
right, which is really the Heavenly Father through his son speaking through Paul, that what? Ye are the temple of the Heavenly Father. And whoever uh, pretty much, uh, 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 pretty much, uh, you know, destroys his temple, the Heavenly Father will destroy him because our body is the temple of the Heavenly Father now, right? So you have to treat your temple well. You cannot eat or smoke and things like that, things that would destroy your temple. Excuse me. Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, like I said, I want to read this in a different translation. Right. The Amplifier says, So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instincts. Right. And this world is very self-centered. People only care about me, me, me. When you come into this faith, you have to understand it's not about you. It's about your Heavenly Father and His Son. And putting the next man above yourself. <clears throat> uh, so continuing, which is sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, right? There's nothing wrong with having passion, but you can have sinful passion, right? Evil desire, another thing. There's nothing wrong with having a desire, but having an evil desire, like a woman. There's nothing wrong with having a desire for a woman, but having a desire for another man's woman, that's wherein lies the error. And greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to the Heavenly Father, right? So having your mind towards these things and, you know, having your mind completely on these things is kind of like an idolatry, meaning that what you're, you're pretty much committing a, 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 a adultery, spiritual adultery, having gone after these things because your mind is so focused on you know, the things of the world that you pretty much treat them like a God. They're pretty much your God. And people don't even know that when they do these things, when they have their mind towards these things, like let's use one that's very easy, money, they're pretty much treating money like their God because they will do and pretty much put themselves in whatever position to make money. And that shows their devotion to these things as if when really your devotion is supposed to be to the Heavenly Father. But because you're chasing after these things, your devotion is going after them as if they are your God. Excuse me. That's why he says, which is which is a kind of idolatry, right? Putting these things on a high pedestal as if they're the Heavenly Father. Example, which again is money. Now, don't get it twisted. Money is needed, but money should not be put up on a pedestal to where you're completely devoted to it. Right. I was talking to an old head when I was in school. He was, you know, throwing me some wisdom about the uh, electrical field and things like that and things that he was going uh, through. And he said something which is money. Do he, he said that people get confused all the time. That is that money doesn't bring uh, bring happiness. Money just gives you options, which is very true. But, and you know, sometimes you'll talk to people in the world and they'll say, yeah, I know that. But really, when you watch them and when you see how they move, they don't move that way. Because if you knew that money only gives you options, then you wouldn't be moving this way and you wouldn't be, uh, you know, doing whatever you have to do, which, you know, you do what you have to do to take care of yourself. But you can see that these people move in a way that it's like money is their God. Whatever I got to do to make the money, it's like if money just says, hey, you got to do whatever you got to do to make me, they just up on their toes, ready to do whatever they can for money, especially those in Hollywood, those who are rich, those who are celebrities of this world. Excuse me, let me just drink a, take a drink of water real quick. Right. They'll do whatever for money. Right. They'll sell their soul to Esau. <clears throat> so like he said, is that money doesn't bring happiness It only what it just it gives you more options. And that's why when these people get in this in this, uh, you know, put themselves in this circle, they just have more options to be rebellious, to be wicked, to be evil, to have more options to open themselves up to different doors, different avenues of wickedness. They can go deeper into that, you know, into that world. So it just gives them more options. Another saying, money doesn't, uh, money just really just exposes who you truly are. If you're a humble, quiet, you know, chill person that only cares about feeding their family, that's the things that you're going to do. But if you are always a, a asshole, if you are always part of my language, a dick, then that's pretty much what money is just going to expose. It's just gonna, it's just going to make you more of what you already are. And that's essentially what you see, like the brother Bacquar mentioned, uh, what was her name? Doja Cat. Essentially, she was always like that. She was always weird, a freak like that. But all she needed is money to, for, for you to really see how she truly is. Diddy. Diddy was always like that. You just needed money to really see how he really is. 
all these people in that in that celebrity room they were always like that they just needed money for you to see how they truly are this is why paul is saying mortify these things because eventually or i'm sorry not eventually but or else you'll end up like them or you can end up like them and you don't have to be in their position to be like them you could just be you know our everyday average individual that's just like them you just don't have access to money like they do to do the things that they do but you can still be like them so continuing verse 6 for for which things sake the wrath of the heavenly father cometh on the children of, uh, of disobedience right being like this brings the wrath of the heavenly father verse 7 in the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. Again, use yourself an example, right? When we were in the world, when we were a part of the world, we did these things that would bring the wrath of the Heavenly Father, <clears throat> right? Verse 8, but having come now into this faith, verse 8, but now ye, I'm sorry, but now ye also put off all these, uh, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. So having come into this faith, we are putting these things off, these things that were of, that we, uh, you know, that we brought, uh, that we had attached to us because we were in the world. So now we're putting away these things, right? Verse nine, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, right? Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, right? Very self-explanatory. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, bar barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Hamashiach is all and in all. Now, as we always go into, when you deal with this Greek, right, it's not talking about the other nations or Edomites. It's talking about Israelites, because when you go into that word Greek, it should be Helen, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Now, this is where they go off, but it says, uh, the second definition says, in a wider sense, the name embraces all nations, not Jews, that made the language, customs, and learning of the Greeks their own, which is incorrect. Because when you go into the history of the Maccabees, which is very important to go into, you had certain Israelites that conformed to the image of the Greeks and what may, uh, made Greek their language, made Greek their custom, made the learning of the Greeks their own. And that's what the scripture is talking about when it talks about the Greeks, when it talks about the Gentiles. It's talking about Israelites that fell away from their customs and got Hellenized and made the Greek customs, the Greek fashion, their own. That's what it's talking about. So when it says where there is neither Greek, which the Greeks are Israelites that are acting Greek, have Greek names. When you go through, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, the lineage of uh, John Hyrcanus, if I'm not mistaken, those are Israelites with Greek names. John Hyrcanus, John Hyrcanus II, uh, what's his name? Alexander Janaeus, Aristobulus. Those are Israelites through that line, but they have Greek names. You see? So you had our people who fell away from their customs and, uh, uh, and pretty much attached themselves to the Greek customs. So that's incorrect definition when they say not the Jews. No. But you did have those who are under... Judas Maccabees and his brothers that were serious that fought to keep the laws, but you had a splitting those who fought to keep the laws. And you read about that in first, and second Maccabees, and you had those that fell away and eventually became known as the Greeks or the Gentiles. But those Greeks and Gentiles are Israelites. They're just being called Greeks and Gentiles because they're acting like the other nations. Although they are the lineage of Israel, they're not acting like Israel. Right. Circumcision, which is those who who know that they're Israelites who are kept the customs and the uncircumcised uncircumcision is those who don't know that they're Israelites. Right. And then keep the customs. Barbarian, Scythian, our people were scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Bond nor free. But Hamashiach is all and in all. So it's very important to understand that those Greeks, those Gentiles that we read about in the New Testament are Israelites, not any of the nations. When you go to Matthew 15 and 24, the Lord said himself, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's not here for everybody. So continuing verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of the heavenly father, holy and beloved, 
bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. So that new man has to put on these things, these things that please the heavenly father, right? Meekness, humbleness of mind, because what we, when we were in the world, we weren't meek. When we were in the world, we weren't humble, right? We were around proud individuals, like the saying goes, birds of a feather flock together. All right. And having been around these individuals, we, uh, we got these uh, certain ways about us, having been around them, right? Which was the opposite of being humble, the opposite of being kind, the opposite of being humble or long suffering, right? Wanting everything now, right? This is like people say popcorn generation. They want everything now, right? We were savage. We were, we were like brute beasts. We weren't kind, affectionate. Excuse me. But having come into this fate, we need to have these attributes now to us. <clears throat> Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Hamashiach forgave you, so, do ye, so also do ye. Right. And I believe the disciples or if not the disciples, a certain individual came up to him and asked him, how many times should I forgive my brother? And the Lord said, 70 times 70 meaning to always come uh, always forgive your brother excuse me apologies to always forgive your brother right if you have any ought with him forgive him fix those problems between you and your brother right right this is not the world when we have in uh, dis uh disagreements or issues with brothers and it's like man part of my language but fuck you get the fuck out of here you want to be a brute beast you want no nah, don't do that ain't this your friend ain't this your homeboy so why are you breaking up a good friendship, right? A little disagreement, a little, you know, you know, a little disagreement shouldn't break up years of friendship or, you know, a strong bond that you have. So it's the same thing in this. We are new men in Yahweh Shai and women in Yahweh Shai. A little disagreement shouldn't break that up. Because if you really was to sit down and talk about what your disagreement is, like men, you'd see that why are we like trying to break up a strong bond? Why are we trying to you know, break this up for what's up with that, right? So if you have any any art again uh, with each other, forgive each other, <clears throat> just as Yahweh Shai, which and even going before Yahweh Shai, the Heavenly Father forgave us, because we have done a lot to the Heavenly Father, and even and even in this faith still continue to do, but they still forgive us. <laughs> Verse fourteen, and above all these things, put on charity, which is love which is the bond of perfectness and let the peace of the heavenly father rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the word of Hamashiach dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, Yahweh Shai, giving thanks to the Heavenly Father, I'm sorry, giving thanks to God and to the Father by Him. <clears throat> Continuing, verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now this is a, a, a difficult one for women, but for you sisters that are in the faith, yes, submitting to your husband is a part of our culture. Like the scriptures say, even as Sarah uh, uh, called Abraham Lord, <clears throat> right? This is something that is in this society, which is with that feminism thing. Women don't like to submit to men. They don't see a reason to submit to men. And in part, they are kind of right. Women are not entirely wrong to see a reason why should they submit to men. Because in this time period, especially or in this age, men aren't men. So in, in a sense, to a certain degree, why should women really submit to men? Now, don't think that I'm trying to be silly in saying that. But really, when you look at some of these men of today really think about it right would you really want to submit to some of these men would you really want to be under some of these foolish men and things like that no but there are certain decent men out there there are some good men out there and a lot of you women don't know how to submit nor uh, when you see a good man in front of your face nor do you know how to treat him what to do with him or anything because you have not been trained up to do that so having come in this fate you have to what submit yourself unto your husband Trust and believe in your husband. The same way the Heavenly Father wants us as the Israelite man to trust and believe in him. It's the same thing that we as men 
mortal men want our women to uh, uh, to do. We want our women to submit to us. We want our women to believe in us. We want our women to look to us for everything. The same way the Heavenly Father wants us to look to Him for everything. Right? And you'll see how much better, how much joy, and how much better a relationship can get when you do these things for your husband. All you got to do is submit. All you got to do is change up your tone, how you talk to him. And you'll see that you'll get better out of your husband. But sometimes when you come in there with the rah-rah attitude, with the certain tone and things like that, and you wonder why the relationship isn't good, it's because of how you treat each other at times. Right? You got to look at it this way. You want to know why the relationship isn't good? Well, it takes two people. There's two people not treating each other with, all right in some way. So you got to fix that. There's something that you're doing that is setting your man off. Maybe your tone of voice. Maybe something that you're not doing that he doesn't like. Or something that you are doing that he doesn't like. The relationship can be salvaged. The relationship can be fixed. It's, it's only is do you want to fix it? So, again, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Right? It is... It is right in the eyes of the Heavenly Father for the wife to submit herself to the husband. That is your position. doesn't mean that you're lacking anything. It doesn't mean that, oh, you're going to be treated like shit. Because that's what a lot of women will say today. Oh, if I submit to you or if I'm the second, that means you're going to treat me like I'm nothing. No. Whoever said that? Really, when you look at it, if you look at the everyday average, a very average relationship, when has the average black man ever treated you women like shit? Never. You women watch too much TV, watch too much social media, and this stuff messes with your mind. And when you finally get in a relationship, you have the world in your mind. You think that, oh, well, he's going to do this to me. He's gonna, and it's like, it never happens. Never. You're bugging yourself out. You're setting yourself up for failure. Get out of the world. The world is not reality. Continue in verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Right. There's like the scripture say, everything must be done decently and in order. Right. And, you know, sometimes men can get sometimes, you know, very listen very closely to what I'm saying. But sometimes us as men can get a little bit too harsh on the women. We need to know how to deal with the women. And sometimes that could come from that red pill rage thing and stuff like that. Where sometimes you get to, man, fuck these bitches and things like that. But it's like, fuck these bitches, but you have a woman at home or, you know, you have a wife and things like that. And yes, you women can get under our skin, but there is a way to deal with women. There is a way to ha uh, to, to uh, coexist with your women, <laughs> right? You got to sometimes drop the red pill rage and things like that and just mellow out, chill out. Not saying be soft with your woman, not saying let her r run over you and things like that. But there is a way that you deal with women. That's why I brought up let everything be done decently and in order. Now, yeah, not everything is going to be perfect. And sometimes your woman is just going to irritate you and things like that. But there is a way to deal with the woman. The same way you got all this wisdom, knowledge, understanding of how uh, female psychology, how women are. Well, there is also a way to deal with the woman so that way you can get what you want out of here. It's not just about how to female psychology and, okay, I know how a woman's mind works and this and that. It's also how to deal with the woman so when you have her, you know how to get the best out of her. You can't just have the female psychology and just be like, oh, well, I know how the my woman's mind works. I ain't going to get tricked and deceived by women. Okay, true. That's nice. But it's also how you deal with the woman when you finally have her. Right? The scriptures talk about not being a lion or frantic among thy servants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. That's another thing, right? Children are not obedient unto their parents, especially in this age, because children are pretty much monsters, right? Pretty much children haven't been raised, or which really, let me excuse me, the parents really don't know how to raise kids. So pretty much the, you know, society, school raises kids and pretty much raises kids to be disobedient. That's why kids have no respect for their elders. That's why they curse them out. Uh, I believe not so long ago, Elder Yashawamba, when I was watching their live stream that they do, I believe on Fridays, you had some little kids talking, dis, dis, uh, saying some disrespectful things to them. Now, I don't know how old Elder Yashawamba and those brothers are. But I'm just going to suggest at least about over 30, right? And here it is. You have some young kids. I'm, I'm, I believe they were on bikes as well. Just being disrespectful, just talking anyway to some grown men like that. That's not supposed to be so. We're not supposed to, we're not, we're, we're not supposed to be 
raising our children like that. So children are supposed to obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Uh, verse 21, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Again, showing you that what? There is even the way that a father is supposed to treat his children. Yes, you may be the authority of the house, but again, there is a way that you're supposed to be in the house. The way that you deal with your, uh, your wife. There's a way that you deal with your children so that way you can get the best out of them. It's not just being the, the father, the man, the masculine uh, in the house. And that's just like fee, fi, fo, thumb, shut the fuck up and do what I suck and say. No. There is a way to do things. The same way the Heavenly Father deals with us. There is a way, right, that he deals with us to get the best out of us. It's not just motherfucker just do it now yeah sometimes it can't be like that but there is a way there's like the saying a method behind the madness right to get the best out of somebody right and sometimes when you want the best out of somebody sometimes you gotta know when to hit the brakes you know get on somebody but then you gotta know when to take your foot off the brakes ease up a bit right feel out the situation can't just be a hundred percent all the time sometimes you gotta ease up or even me sometimes dealing with the, because I'd be around kids, you know, I, I was raised a particular way not to, my parents didn't deal with that BS, you know, so like I can get like that way on kids as well. But sometimes I realize, ease up. If you want something from the kid, you got to ease up because sometimes all that can, you know, chill out sometimes, you know, there's a way to do things. Verse 22, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but singleness of heart, fearing the heavenly father. Right. So when you do things, especially this work, you don't do it to be seen of men. You don't do it to be seen like, hey, I'm doing the work or, hey, you know, that brother's real diligent. No, you don't do that to be seen of men, to be seen as a diligent man in front of other men. You do it for the for, uh, for the fear of the heavenly father. Right. Right. Doing it sincerely. Right like brothers say in sincerity and in truth right doing this to be men pleases to be seen and seen of men and like hey you know i'm doing this i'm doing that yeah that's a real diligent brother right there which you know brothers will give that respect at time to time you know say that hey you're very diligent but you don't want to have that mindset to only you know excuse me to be seen of men that was the issue that yahweh had with what the wicked scribes and pharisees because they want to be seen of men they want to be seen as this this great one but that's why he told his disciples in so many words, um, do the th uh, not uh, do the things that they say, but not the things that they do. Right. Which means, you know, keep the laws, do them, but don't do the things that they do because they don't actually keep the laws. They may tell people to keep this law, to do this, to do that, but they themselves don't do it. So when they say do this, yeah, you do it, but don't do the things that they do because they don't really keep the, the laws of the heavenly father <laughs> they're not truly sincere they just want to be seen of men as some great one but really they weren't they were little right verse 22 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily as to the lord and not unto men right let me see what that may say in a different translation it says whatever whatever you do whatever your task may be work from your soul that is, put your very best effort as something done for the Lord and not for men. Right, and that could take you very far. Do everything, whatever job you may be doing, do it as if you're working for the Heavenly Father. Because think about that will actually translate over. Or really, I should say, for me especially, that when you, you know, do this work, which I try to do this work in sincerity and truth, you know, uh, to the best of my ability, and that actually translate over to, you know, the things that you do in work, the things that you may do in school or whatever. You don't BS. And you'll see that that could, t that could take you a very uh, long way. And a good example that I could think of just recently that I was reading about is Daniel, right? Daniel was a very hardworking individual to the point where he was pretty much, you know, in position to be third in rulership of the, uh, of the, uh, of pretty much the, uh, of the kingdom. Because what Daniel was a very hard worker, Daniel did what he was supposed to do, although he was in captivity. And yeah, Daniel didn't like captivity. Who the hell likes captivity? But what he still worked hard, he still did what he was supposed to do. And you see that when you read, 
Daniel not only did what he was supposed to do, but what the heavenly father delivered him because innocency was in his, uh, pretty much innocence, innocency was in him. Daniel didn't do nothing wrong. He didn't do anything wrong to these, uh, heathens of these other nations that tried to set him up. He did what he was supposed to do. He was just good at it. And he was blessed by the heavenly father. He did what he was supposed to do. He took his captivity. He took the work that he was supposed to do and he just did it. That's all like a man. But these other nations were jealous. These other he, uh, these other nations was jealous of him. Therefore, they wanted to take him out, put him in the lion's den. And the Heavenly Father delivered him because he didn't do anything wrong at all. He was just doing what he was supposed to do. Verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of inheritance, for you serve the Lord Yahweh Shai. But he that do it wrong shall receive the for the wrong which he had done, and there is no respect of persons. All right. So if you do evil, you're going to receive evil. All right. And there is no respect of persons with the Heavenly Father. Meaning that whether you be small, whether you be great, the Heavenly Father doesn't care about that. Everybody's going to get something from the Heavenly Father. Meaning that the Heavenly Father will judge whether you're small, whether you're great, it doesn't matter. Everybody can uh, can get it from the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father doesn't care if you're a great man on the earth and everybody is, respects you, you're well-liked. No, the Heavenly Father will judge you. And if you're small, insignificant, and nobody, the Heavenly Father will still judge you. It doesn't matter. There is no respect like, oh, he, well, he's a nobody. Come on, Lord, have mercy upon him. No. If the judgment needs to come down, the judgment will come down. If he's a great man, everybody loves him. Oh, how could God judge such a great person? Judgment will still come down. There is no respect of persons with the Heavenly Father. So that would be it for Colossians, the third chapter, Lord's Word. I, uh, Lord's willing soon I could go into the fourth chapter. I pray that this video has been edifying. I want to give pray, all praise, honor, and glory again unto Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Racha, Kodash. Double honors to the apostles, elders of the great millstone. Peace and blessings to the hopeful elect. Shalom.